The theme to, for today's stream is Element. And we'll see four performers from four different European countries to prove you that talking about chemistry in an interesting way goes way beyond just flashy explosions. At this point, I would like to thank to two very important institutions. Vida Science Center, that provides a technical background that makes this stream possible, and a European community of science teachers and educators, Science on Stage. Science on Stage organizes biannually a conference where its community members show off their best performances. This year it was organized in Prague, and actually one of our performers tonight hosted the event and two others performed. So, without further ado, let me introduce our tonight's guest. First, joining us from Bulgaria is Nasko Stamenov. Nasko, can you hear us? Hi. Hi, how are you doing tonight? I'm fine, thank you. Thanks. And can you tell us a little bit about what you have prepared for us tonight? Well, it's copper, so if you like the color blue, this presentation is the right for you. Oh, well, that's great. Thank you very much. And next, from the Netherlands, Mark Bette. Hello, Mark. Can you hear us? Hello. Nice to be here. Thanks. Perfect. And what can we expect from you? Well, I uh, found an article about a Chinese lab uh, that developed a process to um, make graphene. And I made a school experiment of this. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. And third, coming from UK, is Michael Lansbro. <laughs> well, good evening. I'm not coming from the UK. I'm actually coming from the Czech Republic. But, and this is my lab uh, where I specialize on research on my, my favorite uh, element from the periodic table. It's the fifth element, and that's the element of boron. And you're going to be learning with me a lot about the beautiful fifth element boron. Thank you, Michael. I hope we made sure that in the subtitles you're, you're titled correctly, UK and Czech Republic. That's right. And last but not least, coming in from my right side, actually, is Adam Blahak. Yeah. Hello, Adam. Hello, hello. And what element did you choose for tonight's experiment? Yeah, I choose uh, uranium. Okay. Thank you very much. So we have all different elements for the streams and we are so excited to have you all here. Thank you very much for coming and I'll get back to the audience. So please have in mind that this is an interactive stream and what makes it interactive is you. So we are streaming to many different platforms and on any platform that you are watching us, you can go to the comment section and ask questions, interact with the questions from our performers and you just make this stream. So this is it from the introduction. I hope we will all enjoy tonight's element. Welcome back, Nasko. Hello. Okay, so we all know, and our audience will see it, that you are very passionate about chemistry. And I would like to ask you, was it always the case, or did you find your way to chemistry in some, at some point in your life? Well, I find my way to chemistry at some point of my life. Uh, it was at the uh, first grade. Um, my parents had bought quite a lot of encyclopedias when I was uh, a little kid and I did the mistake to read them all. So then I was really, really hungry for science. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and so we are ready for your performance. So please, stage is yours. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nasko from Bulgaria, and today we're going to talk about copper. And actually, copper is my favorite element because it's not the best element in anything. But our life is impossible without it. It's not the hardest element, but it was, it's not the hardest metal, but it was the first metal that we made tools from. It isn't the highest term, thermal conductive metal, but we use it to make uh, pots and other vessels for making food from hundreds of thousands and thousands of years now. It's not the most electrically conductive metal, but we use it for most of our wiring in your laptop, in your home, everywhere around you. Electricity is conducted by copper. Of course, some other elements in niche usages, but copper is the mule, is the running force of all of that. And we know about copper for quite a long time. Uh, the first uh, usage of copper dated back uh, to 7,800 BC or so. And at first there was copper that, that's in pure form. Then copper ore started to be smelted and the, the copper extracted. Nowadays, we of course know quite a lot more about that uh, pretty nice element. And uh, here, for example, I have a sample. And this is, uh, this is my really, really favorite sample of copper. It is 99.9% .9 pure. So it's uh, like the, the most electrically used copper. And it's really nice and shiny. Of course, it has a pinkish brown color to it. But that's not always the case. You have seen stuff made out of copper and it's alloy like bronze and brass. And they tend to look differently. They uh, usually become greenish blue, like the Statue of Liberty or your favorite cupolas of building in your town. And why is that? Because copper is not the most reactive metal, but it does react with moisture and carbon dioxide and it produces the alkaline copper carbonate or patina which is a really really nice thick layer that will cover copper and prevent its degradation this is why copper is perfect for archaeology because we have so many tools from the copper and bronze age because they were prevented from disintegration by the patina. From the iron age, not so much. Iron rusts and becomes to dust. But copper, copper will stay. Of course, there are even bacteria who eat copper, like Chromobacterium um, or Luxeum uh, or such. But they are niche organisms. Copper will last you a long time. And uh, on top of that, copper uh, has bactericidal activity. So many bacteria will die by touching copper. This is, uh, uh, was discovered really um, by accident because we had uh, those uh, nice copper doorknobs. And people with uh, copper doorknobs and, and bronze and brass doorknobs tend were tending to become less ill than those with other metals. But let's stop uh, discussing that. Let's see some copper chemistry. And I'm going to show you one of uh, my favorite copper experiments. Of course, we are going to use the salt of the copper. This is the copper sulfate. In my country, it is called blue stone. And it is... Uh, the most copper, uh, common copper salt in the world. You can find it with no real problem anywhere in the world. And um, to, of course, uh, 
make dew of our copper, I'll be needing a little bit of water. And of course, it's the, the water that we can commonly get. So I'll get my bottle of water and we're good to go. So first I'm going to make a little, little nice solution of copper. And as you can see, I don't really care if all the copper is dissolved because actually I need concentrated solution for one thing in, uh, at the end. But let me just pour a few test tubes of the real nice blue copper sulfate. So, what can copper sulfate be used for? Well, copper has the tendency to make complexes, which means that copper can react with molecules that contain oxygen and nitrogen and combine with them, bond with them. And this will actually change color and help us see things. For example, if I have ammonia solution, ammonia is a nice molecule with nitrogen and unpaired electronic couple, and combine that with our copper sulfate, we'll get the nice deep blue color of uh, what is called the Schweitzer react reactive, or Schweitzer reactive in German and in Swiss. Well, this means that uh, if it touches anything that contains such nitrogens, it should become such color. So what I have now, is some gelatin and gelatin is a protein and proteins are made out of amino acids and amino acids of course contain the exact same nitrogen atom that is connected with three bonds to stuff and it has the unpaired electronical couple so when i mix it hmm it's not the deep blue that we expect why so well, ammonia, of course, is basic. It's quite, quite, quite basic. Amino acids, not so much. So I need a little bit of a base. And what I have here is a little bit of sodium hydroxide. And I'll drop some of the sodium hydroxide, a strong base, into that mixture. And lo and behold, when I mix them together, because my gelatin, of course, start to jellyfy everything. When I mix them together, you see the nice, cool color of nitrogen and copper. Beautiful. Uh, did I mention that this is my favorite uh, element? Well, yeah, <laughs> you'll see that. And of course, um, it doesn't react only with proteins. I, I told you that uh, it will react with oxygen also. Of course, water has oxygen, and this is why the copper solution usually is blue, because it has bonded with the water. But what if we use some sugar? I have here some candy. I'll drop it into the solution. And of course, once again, I'm going to pour in just a little bit of the base of our uh, uh, sodium hydroxide and little by little you're getting to see quite 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 blue color this is because we had a reaction between the sugar and the copper and we have them bonded but something really nice will happen if we just heat this mixture a little so i'll get my trusty lamp and i'm going to light it on fire just for you and i'm not showing you the lamp because because it's uh, on top of uh, a contraption that i've made so i can hold it relatively further up so this is uh, as farther up as it goes before dropping on my pants and lighting myself on fire so you'll be able maybe just just to see the flame but not much else and what i'm going to do is i'm just going to 
heat it just a little bit and little by little our sugar will react um, further with the copper helping it reduce and in time nice uh, nice color of orange will appear which I'm going to show you maybe at the end maybe after that so of course uh, those reactions are quite uh, important in analytical chemistry they uh, help us find out whether or not we have sugars and or proteins in some sample well now before i continue with two more experiments with copper i want to ask you a question where does the name copper and the latin version cuprum come from and now you have some seconds to answer that so in the meantime i will prepare myself with the other two experiments so uh, the first one of course will be something that if i have done it 300 years ago i'll may find myself at the stake because i'm going to change one metal to another but before that so do we have some answers waiting for the studio to tell me not yet nasco not yet all right so we'll continue with and then we'll check for them so what i have now is some iron wool iron wool it is used usually to clean up really really nasty burned pots and what i'm going to do with it is i'm going to dip it in a nice solution of copper sulfate well iron is quite the more reactive metal than copper which means that the iron atoms will become iron ions and the copper ions will become copper atoms which means that when i take it out you'll see a change of color my iron has covered with something that is really nicely per, uh, pinkish uh, brown and this is the color of pure copper and if i put it all in and mix it about and screw it around what is going to happen is that you're starting to see that my uh, solution actually becomes different shade of grayish blue and actually it doesn't show perfect on the camera but it starts to get green tint this is because most of my copper is going to react and if i take now this thing you'll see that most most of it is this nice color so i leave that be and we'll talk a bit about the last experiment and for the last experiment i need a little bit of salt and i told you that this is blue because the water has bonded with the copper and we have nice complex of water and copper but now i'm going to pour some salt which will give quite a lot of chlorine ions and what chlorine does is it also wants to bond with the copper so what happens is that our solution actually becomes green but there is more what is going on now is here in my uh, stock solution that still has some crystals of copper sulfate i'm going to pour quite a uh, nice amount of sodium chloride and my solution will become really dark green which uh, you may see as uh, gray green by the camera if uh, if i see correctly but it is nice deep green 
And what's coming next is my favorite part. Because I'm going to take that cup and put it in here. So, so I want you just hold that cup in front of you. What I'm going to put in there is some metal that is more reactive than um, iron. And now the copper solution is more reactive than before. So we have two things that are more reactive to react with each other. And this is aluminum foil. And I've made a nice ball with it. I'm going to drop it into the solution. And at first, nothing special happens. It's just that the aluminum foil, little by little, starts to change color. The same brownish copper that I showed you before. But the more it reacts, the hotter it gets. The hotter it gets, the faster it reacts. And the faster it reacts, the hotter it gets. So, listen. You, you hear sizzling, you see bubbles. If I show you the cup here, you'll be able to see even some steam. This is quite the exothermic reaction. And I really like that one because uh, only with stuff from the market and from agroapothecary, you can make some quite nasty stuff. And this is why I'm holding right here, because the temperature of that reaction is way beyond 100 degrees. All right. So now it is uh, the time to uh, check for answers and, of course, give the correct one. So do we have any answers, studio? C, light, and blue like C, all right. Well, dial on of keeper, all right. What else do we have? Well, not yet, but thanks for the question. Yeah, this is not really an answer to my question, but yes, of course. Um, yeah, island with metal reserves in the Mediterranean Sea. Yes, of course. Um, uh, in ancient times, most of the copper come from the island of Cyprus, or Kipar in Bulgarian, for, for example. And um, at first, copper and its alloys were was called halcos. And of course, we still have that name, like the ore, uh, halcopyrite, for example. But halcos, cuprus, meant uh, copper from Cyper, uh, Cyprus. But they shortened that to Cyprus and then to Kupros in, in the corresponding languages. So yeah, the common nowadays Kuprum in Latin and Copa in English come from the island of Cyprus. Well, I've showed you one of my favorite experiments about my most fav favorite element. And I hope that you enjoyed the time with me. So I'll see you afterwards in the discussion and have a great time with you, all the guys. Thank you very much, Nasco. Thank you. Uh, I didn't know that uh, a lecture about the copper can be this interesting. And uh, we can all see that uh, you're very passionate about copper. And uh, I mean, the question from the audience was that if you've ever been to an island of Cyprus, and you have already answered that. So I would maybe ask another one. And what's the choice of color of your shirt intentional? Well, yes, it is not, not my blue bluest shirt, but I thought it is blue enough for today's uh, expose. Yeah, perfect. Because yeah, I just discovered that I have some copper like blues here and there in my shirt, so I fit in as well. Okay, thank you very much. As you said, we'll see you again in the discussion session. And we'll move on. We have three more performers waiting in line. So please stay tuned and also don't hesitate to comment. Even if it's not in English, we will try to translate if we can, but maybe uh, Nasco was able to translate for himself. And you can ask questions uh, for, for the performers and we will ask them during the discussion session. 
So please stay tuned and we will continue with other experiments. And I'm back here now with Adam. Yeah, hi. Hi, Adam. And I've heard, and even from you, that you've been on a trip. Uh, yeah, I have. I you've have been on a trip in Mongolia <laughs> and teaching kids about science and English in Ulaanbaatar. Is that correct? Yeah, near to Ulaanbaatar. Near I was on a little village called Shuvu Fabrik. It's uh -huh. 40 kilometers away from Ulaanbaatar. Great. And do you have any interesting, preferably short, story that you could share with us today? Story? Ah, I don't know. But uh, we are going to talk about radioactivity. And I uh, have there my Geiger counter also. Uh -huh. So I find free hotspots, some uh, little, little higher radioactive uh, places there. So it's okay. quite interesting there. Great. And is, is there somewhere? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was near to, uh, to Ulaanbaatar. There is a hill or mountain called Tsetsegun, and it's like a sacred, uh, mm -hmm. sanctuary, or how can I say that? Sacred hill. Okay. Sacred hill. Yeah, uh, the uh, mountain. It's radioactive. Yeah, there is. There sacred are, and radioactive. Yeah, also. Oh, okay. also. also <laughs> un invisible forces are there. Yeah. yeah okay. We can, we can talk. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And then the stage is yours. All right. So please, it's up to you. Yeah, so I, I ask for uh, darkness. So we turn off our lights. And we'll look for two things. I hope for two things. First thing is here, maybe. This is our cloud chamber or maybe it's not yeah here it is and there are a little pieces of uranium there if we can focus on it or we cannot yeah and in a while <laughs> maybe we could we could see some White lines, ah, oh, not really, not really, ah, now it's a little bit better, but yeah. If you look really closer, you can see there uh, little lines, what is radioactive particles, what are shooting from our samples, but we are looking for bigger, bigger samples here next to our cloud, cloud, uh, cloud chamber, and this is a piece of uranium ore, our Czech uranium ore. Uh, can we see that or not? Not really, we, can, we can't focus. Yeah, now we have that. Yeah, this is one piece of uranium ore. And if we shine with a UV light on it, we can see a really nice color. It shines with green color and here is also some reddish color. Uh, the red, red thing, it's not uh, uranium, it's some kind of calcite. But the green thing, it's some kind of uh, uranium mineral. Now we can uh, turn on our lights. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm also a little bit reddish. Not anymore. And we can, uh, if we look to our uranium sample, it's right here. Uh, it's just a boring stone. Yeah, you can see it's uh, just a black, black pieces of stone. Nothing interesting, but we use it in many, many fields. And uh, here comes the first question for you: Where we can find uranium in nature or in some artificial products? It's up to you. So type it into comment, and we uh, look look on it in a while, in a minute. But first we'll look for our uranium ore, if you can shoot it a little bit closer. Yeah, you can see there are little, little bubbles, bubble-like structure, and it's very typical for this kind of uranium ore. 
uh, this uranium ore I found on a uh, first date with my uh, girlfriend in Příbram. Příbram is Czech, Czech city, famous with uranium mines. And we can measure it, actually. Yeah, because radioactivity is everywhere, everywhere around us. I have this gyner counter with me, and it shows that there are 0.3 something microsieverts per hour, or 0.5, something like that. Nothing, nothing high, nothing what we could be uh, afraid. But if we put it close to our uh, uranium stone, it's, it's a lot higher, yeah. It's higher. Yeah, this is quite a dose. It's uh, something like, it should be something like 500 microsieverts per hour. So it's quite, uh, quite active, quite radioactive. And this little, little uh, clicking sound, this is uh, radioactive particles which are shooting to our detector. And if we look closer to our uranium uh, sample, we can see a nucleus. And that's a really important part if our radioactive physics, yeah, nuclear physics. And what happened in our uranium sample? This is one of atom, one nucleus of atom of uranium. And it is, there is some protons, this is, this is the whitish things, and the black things, it, this is uh, neutrons. And uh, as we know, I think, the uranium is unstable. So it shoot two protons and two neutrons away, which we called alpha particle. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. And in this case, it changed. The elements changed. The atom have changed. Because uh, element is based on atomic number, which means the number of protons there. But the number of protons have changed already. So now it's not uranium, but now it's uh, thorium inside. And it should this like little, quite, quite big particle, alpha particle. And we can look on this particle with a special camera, which can uh, show us the radiation. This is it. Yeah, yeah, we can. Now we have it even the screen. Yeah. Now nothing interesting is there. Maybe some particle radioactive now and there. And now we put it closer to our sample. And we can see that a lot of things are happening here. Yeah, it's quite, uh, quite amazing. Ha, ha, ha. And if we stop it, we can see that there are some, some bigger, here is some bigger particle. This is the alpha particle, uh, what we are uh, mentioned earlier. But what is the rest? The rest is beta particles and gamma particles, and gamma radiation and beta radiation. And it is caused by another element which are radioactive and what are, what are daughters of our uranium. Because thorium is also radioactive, unstable, and it radiates not alpha particles, but beta carb particles. So one of its neutrons changed to protons, and during this change, the electron is emitted. So this is the a better particle. And now it's no longer a thorium, but it's a protactinium. And the protactinium is also radioactive and it decay in a decay chain. We can show our decay chain, maybe. Ah, yeah, here it is, here it is. So here is the star, here is our uranium, and decay to thorium, then protactinium, and it goes like this to the end, which is here, and that's a let. Nice, we can, uh, we can close it. Thank you, thank you very much. And now we are going to talk about one of the elements which is uh, daughter of our <laughs> uranium. But firstly, I have a... No, firstly, yeah, I, uh, I show it to you. Yeah, that's what I want to do. This is uh, things where is polonium, which is created by a decay of uranium. It's a, there should be a polonium 210, so it has 200 
and 10 uh, protons and neutrons. And it was created in USA in the 50s. And here is, this is a fire plug with polonium, a radioactive element. This is something what is, uh, what is written on the box. And if we put our uh, Geiger counter nearby, you can notice that nothing really happened. It's, um, it's decreasing. So maybe it's not really radioactive. And here's, here comes the second question from me to you. Uh, what, uh, yeah, why didn't we measure anything? There are three possibilities what could happen. The first thing is that our device can't detect this kind of radiation which is emitted by this polonium thing. And, or, or the second one is it stopped being radioactive somewhere in history. It's no longer radioactive. Or there is a third option that it was just for marketing because it was cool to have everything radioactive. So the salesman decided they will, we will, he will write that this spark plug is radioactive. So, right answers, A, B, C. And now we can look for answers where we can find the uranium. What do you think? Yakimov, yeah, that's a quite famous Czech uranium mine, already closed. Yeah, Dolny Rožinka is also the uh, mine in Czech Republic. The, our last opened mine, but it's already closed now, a few years. And all right, all right. And we can find uranium also in some artifacts, some things like uh, atomic bombs, maybe. Or uh, the big thing now, energetic, the nuclear power, power plants. There we, there is also uh, uranium used. But we are, looking, we are looking for some special things and we are going to look to history. And in history, uranium was quite popular for coloring things like some ceramics or glasses. Yeah. This green color is colored by uranium. It is a nice green color. And if we put it to UV light, um, but we need a dark first. Yeah. If we put it under the UV light, we will uh, see that this glass, colored by the uranium, shines, shines nice green. Yeah, the, the best thing, I think, is these buttons yeah, for some short glass, uranium glass buttons. But uh, we can use, or we used uranium not only for green color, color but also for orange one, red one, black one, it was uh, really popular for coloring, ceramic special. This was one I used in history. And I have something really, really interesting, what I think it is. Yeah, turn on the light, thank you. And uranium and all the radioactive samples was quite popular in history and medicine, maybe some, uh, some cosmetic also. And in Czech Republic, we uh, there was manufactured some radioactive uranium soap. So in history, like in 20s or 30s, we uh, was creating this soap. But I have only the box. So it's kind of a weird part of our history, I think. And now we can look for your answers. What about the spar plug and the polonium inside? What do you think? Do you have any? Yeah, the B. Uh, the B was it's no longer radioactive. Okay. Any other idea? C. So it was only for marketing. Okay. Yeah, the marketing purposes. Okay. And other? Do we have the other answer? C also. Yeah, the Shimon thing double yeah. <laughs> for two th two people. Okay. Uh, the right answer was B because it was probably radioactive. I hope so. <laughs> So there was a polonium, but polonium has a half-life, something like 130 days. So after 70, 70 years, I think not many polonium uh, 
is there. All of it is uh, let now, I think. So the right answer was B, so uh, one our viewer is right. So thank you, and I can pass the, the screen to others. Thank you, thank you Adam very much. And it's great, it was not only uranium, it was also polonium here. Yeah, polonium's great. And uh, I would like to ask you, uh, you mentioned that you take this thing around with you everywhere you go. Right? Yeah, yeah, something other. I have, I have a lot of types of these uh, things. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so apart from like exploiting sacred places, yeah. what else do you use it for when you have it around you? Um, in Mongolia or in the Czech Republic? Like usually, an anywhere. Yeah, I have one, uh, one uh, device, one Geiger mill counter, and it can measure uh, the spectrum of the gamma. It can do a gamma spectroscopy. So you can say what elements are in your sample. Uh -huh. That's quite interesting. Okay. okay. Because I, I was just imagining you going through a market, like open market, yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. find things like these, yeah, it's, and measuring everything in the market, true, buying the true, ones true. that tick the most. Yeah, I, I'm right? this kind of crazy guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's so, also true. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Do you need uh, any expert of radioactivity in Mongolia? Uh, not really, but I'm an expert in ge geology. Yeah, geology. geology. Mm -hmm. I was in the Museum of Mineralogy and Geology in a s uh, Faculty of Science on University of Mongolia. And there was uh, one, one lady who know a lot of well, minerals and uranium mm -hmm. and their mines of coal, especially. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, so thank you, thank you Adam again. We've heard uh, two presentations about two elements and we have two more to go. So please thank you everyone who contributed to the comments. Please continue doing so and we are ready to continue with other experiments. Mark, and I, when I saw your presentations and uh, performances, I really enjoyed that you used a lot of props and uh, uh, you were able to add a lot of comedic uh, aspects to it, which was a lot of fun. So I wanted to ask you, have you ever considered to be a magician? <laughs> no, no, I haven't, no, sorry. But I, I, during my lessons about burning uh, experiments, uh, I do flash paper, so I have a little bit magic tricks in my lesson. Yeah, I think it would be a great magician. So anytime you would consider it, I would be uh, there to see you. Okay, thank you. And we are all ready to see your experiments and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, okay. Um, I'm going to tell you something about uh, graphene. And um, for the people who do not know graphene, it was discovered in 2004. And the people who discovered graphene uh, got the Nobel Prize in 2010 for this discovery. Um, it's 200 times stronger than uh, steel. Uh, it's a great electric conductor and so on and so on and so on. So all over the world, uh, people are searching for uh, a way to make graphene on a large scale because then they can lot, make a lot of money. Um, so I found an article about a lab in China um, that had developed a process uh, by calcination of calcium carbonate um, with magnesium to create um, graphene. So they used um, an oven. The oven was filled with argon and the oven was heated till 850 degrees. So um, at that point, the calcination started. So Alice, can you show me please the slides of the chemical reactions? Thank you very much. So you can see that during 
um, the process in the oven at a temperature at 850 degrees, the calcination of calcium carbonate starts and calcium oxides uh, and um, CO2 um, exist. The CO2 will react with magnesium and form magnesium oxide and um, um, carbon monoxide. And the carbon monoxide will react with magnesium and then um, carbon will um, show up. So thank you, uh, Alice, for this. Uh, thank you. The um, carbon was examined and it turned out to be graphene. So they have discovered a way to create uh, graphene. So the, the chemistry behind this whole project is uh, more or less uh, similar to the curriculum that we have in our country uh, for the school exams, uh, chemistry. And the good thing was, uh, I have all the chemicals in my uh, classroom. The only problem that I had was I don't have an oven, uh, which is filled with argon. So I had to, had to find a way to create enough heat for this calcination. So I thought of using a excess of magnesium because when you burn magnesium and um, the temperature temperature can rise till 2200 degrees, that should be enough for this uh, calcination uh, reaction. Um, so I tried that and it turned out it worked. So I have created a school experiment uh, which I can demonstrate in my classroom and I can demonstrate the principle behind this uh, experiment from China. Uh, Alice, can you show me the slide of the carbon structures, please? Thank you. So um, for me, this is very important to, uh, to announce because I don't want to give the impression that I can make graphene with this experiment. I only can demonstrate the principles behind this process because we all know that uh, carbon can have different structures and you have to have the right circumstances to create graphene. And in my classroom, I don't have those circumstances. So again, I'm not pretending to create graphene. I'm demonstrating the principles behind. Thank you, Alice. So um, during my school experiment, I use uh, calcium carbonate and I use one spatula of calcium carbonate put it in a porcelain dish, and then I use an excess of magnesium. So in this case, I will mix two spatula magnesium with my calcium carbonate, and I will make a mixture of it. And I will demonstrate this, I will show this mixture to my students because they have to know, they have to see that the mixture is light gray. They have to know that because we learn them if we have a chemical reaction, uh, they change the, uh, for instance, color or so, then we can see it's a chemical reaction. So they have to see the first starting material. Uh, Alice, thank you, Alice. So now this, there's enough heat for this calcination and this is the process that takes place. And this is the result. And you can see there's a big difference between the starting materials and the materials after the reaction. I did bring a result. You can really see it's very dark. So there should be carbon in it. Uh, Alice, can you see, show the uh, slide with the student activities? Thank you. So um, during my lesson, um, I will ask my students to answer these questions. So they should be able to describe the starting and the ending substance. They should be able to describe the reaction phenomena, explain which phase magnesium has in the oven, it's molten, um, explain why the oven is filled with argon uh, that doesn't react with other chemicals. So. Um, um, they have to make the reaction equation correctly. They 
should recognize molecules, salts and metals in these reactions. And um, thank you, Alice. So now I have a, a, a new problem in my classroom with my students because we have a mixture of three solid chemicals and I want to separate the carbon from this mixture. And the question to you all is, um, how can I um, uh, separate the carbon from this mixture? So I will give you some time to give an answer um, to the organization. If we have an answer, you can show it if you want. Okay, I will I will wait and then uh, continue and then we ah oh nice centrifuge would be interesting. I think it's uh, uh, I, I think there is a way that uh, is easier than centrifugate. Um, so I hope that my students um, will recognize um, calcium oxide and magnesium oxide uh, as a base, like acid base. Uh, so I hope they will recognize it as a base. And then they should uh, answer that I have to use uh, an acid. And in this case, I will use hydrochloric acid because when it uh, reacts, with the mixture, calcium oxide will react to calcium chloride and the magnesium oxide will react to the magnesium chloride. Both are salts that are very good soluble in water. So they will solve into my mixture. Um, Alice, can you show me the movie about uh, where I add the acids? So now it's an interesting thing because uh, there's also gas in this reaction. You can really see there's a lot of gas coming uh, from um, the reaction. And oh, please pause, 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 pause. <laughs> Stop the video, please. Stop the video, please. Alice, thank you. Uh, um, so uh, you saw that there was a gas. Um, and I want to know if you can answer the question, which gas uh, did appear? So we have uh, a couple of um, options. I can't read. Uh, oh, the first one is hydrogen. Uh, the second one is oxygen. The third one is carbon dioxide. And D will be helium. Thank you, David. Correct. B, okay. Thank you, Daniela. A. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Lucy. A. Okay, very nice. Thank you very much for uh, answering this, uh, this question. Uh, the thing is, um, when I have uh, used an excess of magnesium um, and the magnesium will react with uh, the hydro hydrochloric um, acid, hydrogen will be formed. If there still is calcium oxide in this mixture because it didn't react or because I used an excess of it, um, carbon dioxide will be um, uh, in this reaction. So um, two gases are possible, hydrogen gas or um, carbon dioxide will be uh, another possibility. Uh, thank you for the answering my questions. Um, so, um, I have now a mixture of um, a solution from calcium chloride and magnesium chloride. And in the mixture is a, a solid carbon structure uh, and I have to separate this from this mixture. So the next question is, how do I separate it from uh, my mixture? So you saw it already on the on the movie. Of course, we use uh, filtration for this uh, process. And uh, after the filtration, this will be uh, the result. 
So you can see a lot of black material in the filter, and this is uh, carbon. So this is um, more or less a summary from the whole process. Um, thank you. Uh, Alice, can you show the whole experiment, uh, please, as a summary? Thank you, Alice. Thank you. So uh, for me, um, this is a more or less a simple experiment with a lot of chemistry in it. And that's why I'm very enthusiastic about this experiment. Uh, it's uh, very good for the students to think with you as a teacher. You can ask the right questions and then you can train the, the children uh, in their chemistry. So for me, this is uh, a very nice experiment and I hope that you all also will be very enthusiastic about this experiment and you will do it in your school also. So do you have any questions about this experiment? There's actually one question coming from me and you mentioned that uh, you do not claim that you create graphene you're just uh, exploring the principles. And what would it actually take to create graphene? And what, under what conditions can we use these principles, this experiment to create and produce graphene? Yeah, so in, in the experiment that the uh, Chinese people uh, did, in the, uh, did in their uh, Chinese lab, um, you really have to um, have a good temperature because my temperature 2,200 deg degrees is much too high they go to 850 uh, degrees. And it's very important that um, uh, during this process, the magnesium melts because then it forms a very thin layer on the calcium carbonate. And then you will get also the thin layer of the uh, graphene. If you do it like my uh, process, you will get more graphite, I think, I assume. Um, but uh, the circumstances are not good enough to make graphene. So the temperature is very important and the molten position of uh, um, magnesium is important. Uh-huh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I can definitely enjoy your students enjoy. Uh, uh, sorry, I can definitely imagine your students enjoying this kind of lesson. So thank you very much for demonstrating this. And we we are here. Uh, so if we have a question, we are yeah, we, we have time for one more question uh, from the audience. Um, yeah, I, I thank you. What a, what a very nice question. Yes, I do because the the possibilities with graphene uh, are um, huge. Um, I, I, I did read um, one thing that was very nice because they they can make little holes in the graphene uh, structure, and do, doing that um, they uh, it, it it enables people to uh, take salt seawater. Uh, put, pour it through the filter that you created, uh, the graphene with the holes, and then you have drink water. So it, it, making the drinking water will be very easy if we have a lot of graphene. So uh, yes, I'm really fond about graphene and the possibilities. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lucia, for the question. Thank you for answering that and introducing Graphene and its applications and experiments to us. And we are ready to continue. We've seen three performances and we, are, we have one waiting in line, but as we have a discussion session later, we are approximately in the, in the middle of the stream. So please stay tuned, con continue interacting in the comments and we are ready to continue. And Michael, welcome back on stage. Thank you. And as you've mentioned, you are now in Czech Republic. You are affiliated with Czech Academy of Sciences. And uh, sorry, I forgot, what's the town called where your lab is located? So my lab is in a, in a small town called Ozeš, uh, which okay. is uh, about 15 kilometers uh, north of Prague on the, uh, on the banks of the Lutava River. Uh, yes, thank you. I just, yeah, I remembered. Sorry, I just wanted to hear you saying that. Uh, but what I wanted to actually ask is that you gave presentations and performances a lot of different settings, right? I mean, you gave presentations and science shows in larger or smaller audiences, but you also have to uh, uh, defend your work in academia. And also, uh, I mean, you're the one who hosted the Prague Science Stage. And I definitely saw you on television at least once. So from all of these different settings where you can present, where do you feel most comfortable? Oh, well, I think I personally, I, I, I get different feelings and, and different benefits in different scenarios. So um, working on in front of a camera for television, that gives me um, a sort of a thrill of the um, the studio, the lights, the the, the pressure to get it right, uh, and that's very much different to when you're in a, a live performance where you have this interaction and energy with the the audience. Um, each has a different sort of characteristic, and and each one is is very sort of is fantastic in its own different way. Perhaps though, um, I suppose my favorite is is really to have that live performance, that live, that contact with the people, that the energy in the room, the the adrenaline uh, of the the live performance. I think that's maybe the best. Yeah, I can imagine. Now, right now, you are in your lab, right? So you won't get that energy from the interaction, but we hope no, we will no. get interaction through the comments. So please, now stage is yours, and we are so excited to see you. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity, for this stage, um, and to, to be able to be in contact with everybody on the other side of, of this camera and my computer. Um, following on from three fantastic performances, uh, you know, it's great to learn. I, I love, I lo as a chemist, I love, I love all the elements and uh, copper, uranium and carbon are, are fantastic, fantastic elements. Um, but I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, my, my favorite elements of all, of all the, the possibilities from the periodic table. Um, my personal favorite is actually the element next door to carbon. Um, and that's uh, boron, this little beauty. Um, so you can see the uh, two important numbers associated with boron. You've got the, the number five here, which is, of course, it's atomic number. It's how many protons uh, an atom of boron has. Uh, that's why it's the fifth element. And uh, this, but the second number here is uh, the the total number of the, the total mass, the atomic mass of the of of, a, of the average boron atom. And it's not a whole number. It's ten point eight, which is interesting. That means it's got. Uh, a number of well two isotopes so uh, most of boron is found with five protons and then six neutrons which would bring up to boron 11 but 20 percent of the time 20 percent, which is a large fraction for a light element it has a second isotope boron 10 and that's a very important isotope which has all sorts of other um, applications which i'm going to come to uh, shortly but um, boron is a is a really 
unique element in the, in the sense that it's not made in the usual way. And when I say made, elements, the lighter elements in particular, certainly all the way up to, to iron, are made through nuclear synthesis in, in big, in stars. So in the, the cores of stars where we get nuclear fusion, where lighter elements are compressed and they overcome the repulsive forces to squash together and to form new, gradually heavier and heavier elements, all this occurs in the stars. And, um, but in, in the case of boron, there's no mathematical way to get to the fifth element. You can't add up the gradually the heliums with more hydrogens with more heliums to eventually get to, to boron. So it's really a puzzle that it exists at all. And it exists, in fact, in a similar way to how uranium exists. It requires a supernova. It requires the star to explode, to really generate enough energy to, to fragment a lot of the heavier atoms and recombine these elements into other forms. And from these huge events, you can get boron. And eventually, that some of that will, will, will be in the, the nebulous, which forms planets like our own. And uh, thanks to that, we have boron as well on this planet. And we find boron on this planet as we find most uh, elements as an oxide. Here's a, a sample of boron oxide. Like most things, it's a, a white powder. Um, but boron oxide has uh, um, quite a... a an interesting history in terms of of what people have done with it over the ages so the these generally salts of boron oxide that we find they were called bor borax and their their first uses were were found by the ancient egyptians and the ancient egyptians egyptians found mines of of borax in what is today's turkey it was then part of the hittite empire and they discovered that these borax salts were very good at desiccating, at extracting, removing water from things. And it became very useful to the ancient Egyptians for the mummification of bodies, uh, in particular pharaohs, of course. And so it became a very expensive and, and important material for this ideal uh, way of desiccating the body quickly, removing the water to ensure a, a perfect mummification process. Later on, um, ancient Romans, they discovered when they were making glass, that's because, of course, glass like this is mainly silicate, so it's mainly silicon oxide, sand. Uh, but they found that, well, if you add a little bit of borax, a little bit of boron, then the, the, con the actual properties of the glass somewhat change in that it becomes far less fragile. And in particular, it can cope with huge temperature shock so i've just poured here are the coldest substance we have readily available available for us that's liquid nitrogen so that's minus 196 degrees and that thermal shock though is not enough to make this glass crack and that's because of the boron that's in this uh, silicon oxide which is implanted there with you add a bit of borax salts into the into the glass mixture when you're heating it up and that gives this wonderful property and indeed to today uh, the uh, the use of of borax salts into various ceramics is a very important and uh, part of its how it's marketed and how it's sold into the current days you know markets and how boron figures in our in our industries but what I want to concentrate on today is something that happened in 1912. You see, 1912 is a year that, if you've seen the film Titanic, uh, where the, the great ship Titanic sank. And on that same year, well, there was a person who did a remarkable bit of chemistry. He managed to replace the oxygen in these borax salts with hydrogen and form thus the first boron hydrides or, or boranes. And in fact, my first question to you this today is, which chemist synthesized the first boranes in 1912? And there's four possibilities. Was it Albert Einstein or Emil Fischer or Alfred Stock or indeed me, myself, back in 1912, Michael Lonsborough? 
So the uh, I'll let you think about that a bit and, and give me the, the your suggestions for the answers. Anyway, the uh, the chemists who did uh, who did manage to do this, he discovered really a new boom in inorganic inorganic chemistry. You see, boron. <laughs> yes, it was me. No, it wasn't me. Um, boron is uh, once again Albert Einstein, Emil Fischer, Alfred Stock, or Michael Lonsborough. That's the question. Who synthesized the first boranes? Right. Uh, I indeed. Well, there we are. Is it B? In, indeed, it is B. Correct answer there. This is the gentleman here, Alfred Stock, a genius. He also did some amazing. Alfred Stock was C, was he? I beg your pardon. Yeah, so it was C. C is a correct answer. It's Alfred Stock. But uh, so Alfred Stock, German chemist in 1912, his supervisor, PhD supervisor, was Emil Fischer. He did some amazing work in organic chemistry. He also announced to the world that uh, it's a shame that, the, that our planet has this remarkable process of photosynthesis, which is unique to carbon, which turns the oxide of carbon, carbon dioxide, into a hydride of carbon, hydrocarbon, and hydrocarbons, which of course are the, the be all and end all of organic synthesis of our beginnings and life and color and everything on this planet. And he was keen to set his PhD students, the best of which was Alfred Stock, to look into these other elements, are there other elements that can form a series of hydride compounds? And Alfred Stock came up with the hydrides of boron, the boranes. Now, you've seen in the previous talk some of the structures that carbon makes. They tend to be these flat um, ring-like or chain-like structures. Well, Alfred Stock realized and found out that boron, with its hydrides, form these amazing three-dimensional, very beautiful, what are called polyhedral structures. Here's a 12-vertex icosahedron. And so these boranes suddenly began to increase in their number, more and more synthesized, and they realized that boron, after carbon, is the element which has the greatest potential to form hydrides. I want to talk about and show you what some of these hydrides can do. Okay, so here I've got, um, what I'm going to do is going to put this little dish in front of me here. I've got a, a small amount of uh, boron hydrides here dissolved in, uh, in, some, in a solvent, and I'm going to pour it out here onto my plate carefully, because in the same way as hydrocarbons are very useful to us as fuels, well, it didn't take long before the boron hydride chemists discovered that uh, boron hydrides also oxidize in air. But when they do so, and I hope you can see that nicely, it gives a wonderful big, big difference to if I, if I burn carbonaceous materials in oxygen, we get this orange flame. Whereas here, if I take the boron hydrides, they give a wonderful green flame. Now look at that. And often actually when the first during uh, the, some of the major projects which were developing boron hydride chemistry, they called those projects the Green Dragon. Now, it didn't take long before they recognized they could calculate how much energy is being given off via this oxidative process with boron hydrides compared to carbon hydrides, which were the fuels of the day. And they realized that, and they calculated, and they, they also measured that this oxidation process of the boron hydrides is giving off much more energy per unit volume than if I use hydrocarbons. Well, that led to a big boom, what happened next. Because you see, now we're talking about the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, and it was all about, let me get this the right way around, it was all about trying to find rocket fuels. So here in the Czech Republic, in Zesh, where I have my labs, there are some top secret research works looking into the boron hydrides as a potential new rocket fuel. Now, uh, I'm going to show you what, how we can go from an oxidation process, an easy one, such as we've just seen here with the burning of boron hydrides, and ramp it up to actually get a rocket propulsion. It's not actually that difficult and something you can do in your schools or even at home if you're very courageous. 
And indeed, you don't need a lab like mine to be able to make the boron hydrides. Borax, the salts of boron oxide, can be found in, in many different um, products that we find at home. They're often in, in washing powders, for example. And if you dissolve uh, borax, salts of boron oxide, in alcohols, you can form these bor boron esters, which have a similar effect if dissolved then and burnt in alcohol, you'll also get that nice green flame. Now, in any oxidation process, especially with the boron hydrides, which are releasing its energy, which are in these bonds, so you've got, the, you've got your boron hydride uh, molecules, which have these wonderful polyhedra. All the energy is trapped inside these bonds. And when you get oxygen coming through, you begin the burning process, you're forming new molecules of, of boric acid, boric, boron oxide, and water, and that reaction is very quick, very fast. All the, all the old bonds, bonds are breaking and new bonds are being formed. And that's releasing the energy difference between the older bonds and the new bonds as the energy is being released. And if that reaction happens quickly, then we get the, a big expansion of gases which are being produced. And that expansion of gases can act as a reactor force and a propulsory, a propulsion force for a rocket. So all we need to do really to make a rocket and make some rocket fuel is to have the right chemistry, as we have here, and then you just need to force those new molecules of gas that have been formed to go through a small area and therefore create a propulsion force. So this is essentially all you need to make as a rocket. You just need a bottle uh, with a, a cap. Now, the cap, I've just put a hole in, in the middle there. Can you see the hole there? You can see the hole there. Right there in the middle. Well, that that hole is what I'm using to really confine to to confine the space to force these molecules that have been formed inside our rocket to come through to really push through this confined area to come through. So that's how I can get the, the propulsion force. Then, uh, so inside my rocket, all I do is I put a bit of fuel. So um, right, I have some here. Here we go. Oh, there we go. We're in the squeeze bottle. So I'm going to put a bit of my my fuel inside here. I don't need much at all. I'm going to shake it a bit. I'm going to use my my hand just to warm this borane uh, alcohol mixture up, just to get the 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 transition to vapors. So it's mixing with the air a bit better. On the top here, I've just sellotaped a, a simple straw because I'm gonna use that to guide the, the way my rocket's gonna fly. And I've got along here a simple piece of string. So what I wanna do is I'm going to take my bottle and I'm gonna put the string through the end of the straw, push it through like that. Okay, now I just need to empty my bottle of the remaining fuel carefully onto the floor. I'm going to go back over here. Okay, it's all tight and ready. Now, hopefully, you can still see this. I'm going to take my my fuel over here. I'm going to take my lighter. Are you ready? Can you see it all? Ready? Count down. Three, two, one. So that's it. We got the propulsion that we needed. That rocket really did fly. I only needed a very small amount of my fuel, the borane fuel. I'm going to go back to this, my second question. You've already seen it once. It's a really easy one. And the second question is, can I ask for you to put the... Okie dokie. Yes. With... Yeah. Put it back onto the screen. Or I've just lost it. It is with which color... Do the boron hydrides, there we go. With what color flame do the boranes burn? Is it pink or is it green? Is it blue or is it orange? It's dead easy, of course. I'm gonna show you once again. Okay. I'll put the remainder of my, my borane fuel here. So the top secret laboratories here in Azege, 
they would often have uh, people coming to see from the eye just to see how things are progressing. People who are interested in these new rocket fuels. Here we go again. Here's the answer, of course. It gives a beautiful green flame, the green dragon. And I want to explain, though, how eventually the Borains didn't become the rocket fuel of choice. And that's for the following reason. When I burn hydrocarbons in oxygen, I form carbon dioxide and water, both of which are gases that can leave the engine of the, the, the rocket uh, without any, any, any sort of deposition of anything. Whereas when I'm burning boron hydrides, I'm forming water, but I'm also forming something else. I want to show you it here. Here, can you see it on the camera? See that white? That's, that's boron oxide. So the oxide of boron, Whereas the oxide of carbon, carbon dioxide, is just a, a gas that would leave the engine of the, of the rocket. Well, when we use borane fuels, the problem is you get accumulation of boron oxide. And it's a white powder. And that white powder will eventually stop the rocket from working. So you get a lot of initial energy and a lot of initial acceleration, which is superior to normal rocket fuel. However, the accumulation of this white powder destroys the actual trajectory eventually. Nevertheless, I think even Elon Musk's X, X space X thingy rockets, they do use a little bit of borings at the beginning to get the initial thrust. But to finish with, I want to show you, of course, today's rocket fuel that's used. And today's rocket fuel is... Almost. Today's rocket fuel is none other than almost broke the dishes there. So there's another one. What I've got over here, here we go. This is today's rocket fuel. It's, of course, hydrogen gas. And hydrogen gas gives a wonderful oxidative reaction, which you are very much, you're going to know, and you'll probably be familiar with. Let me just position this balloon in the right place. Let's get it onto the, the floor. Here we go. Now, this don't try at home, kids. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to just show you the real rocket fuel of today. It is, of course, oxidizing hydrogen to give water and a lot of energy. Three, two, one. Ooh, boom. <laughs> and with that, that's my short introduction to boron hydride chemistry. It began with the rocket fuel. But today we're doing really, you know, we're doing wonderful things with these molecules. It's a shame to take such a wonderful, synthesized, beautiful polyhedral molecule and just burn it for rocket fuel. Instead, we're learning far more about what these molecules can do in biology, in materials, in optics. We've got new lasers, new potential pharmaceutical molecules. There's lots coming out of these labs which are going to be making life for everybody that bit nicer. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to the discussion that's going to come now. Thank you, Michael. It was such an enjoyable experience to watch you talk about your favorite element. And I must say also informative because Boron, I guess from the elements that we saw tonight, is the one that we learn the least in our lifetimes. So this, I guess, was very informative for a lot of us. And uh, do we have a question from the audience? I'm asking the studio. And uh, this is another question. <laughs> I don't know which part because we saw a lot of things, a lot of things blowing up. Uh, but yeah, this is good hobby. Uh, a, um, a question? No, not yet. So we probably will hear some questions during the discussion session. And uh, we can then move on to the discussion, as we, as we heard. And we will get to all the questions that we did not get to during, during the performances. And I'll also, I hope, we will get some discussion going in between our performance. I'm looking forward to it. And we're getting it to now.
Okay, so now that we've seen all the performances, I welcome back on stage everyone. Adam here, yeah. Nasco, Mark, and also Michael that we saw just recently. And uh, now I would like to ask the studio if we have some questions that have not been answered yet, so we can see them. Okay, so we have one from the account, my favorite experiments through YouTube. Does the reaction usually go to completion so that there would not be both magnesium and calcium carbonate left when you mix with acid? That is a question to Mark, I guess, right? That's a very good question. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, I'm not sure because um, you saw in the picture that um, the result in the porcelain um, uh, classwork uh, is black and white and the white material can be uh, calcium uh, carbonate and it also can be of course it's magnesium oxide and calcium oxide but probably also some calcium uh, carbonate so I cannot guarantee if all the cal calcium carbonate re reacts and all the magnesium reacts no sorry Mm -hmm. okay. Good question. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question and for your answer. Is there any other question from the audience? Okay, I guess we've received one question from Michael directly, and I think it's best that you ask it yourself. Yeah, uh, I was very, I was very impressed with the um, that sort of homemade synthesis almost of of, uh, of graphene. And um, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, of course, one of the, the many interesting properties that uh, chemists are trying to develop with graphene is its conductance, is its electrical uh, conductivity. And I was wondering, did you do anything with what you separate, what you actually uh, made? Did you try any sort of conductivity experiments? Um, no, I did not. Uh, and that's because in, in the Netherlands, we have a, a clear line between this is chemistry and this is physics. And uh, in, in our country, electricity is physics. Um, and um, my goal with my students is I want to, I want to show them some uh, possibilities with the chemistry, with the experiments. Um, they have to understand what we can do with some products. Um, but uh, the level of my students is not the highest level in, uh, in the Netherlands. So I also have to uh, compromise uh, with what I teach and what I do not teach. I think that if I had a group of a higher level, um, gymnasium, for instance, uh, then uh, I probably would ask them, find a way to uh, control if there is electricity uh, conduction here. Because what you could do, you could just smudge a bit on a piece of paper and then if you create a simple circuit with two wires to an LED yeah. and one's linked to a battery, and then the, there's a break in the circuit, which you can then put the two wires on either edge of the smudge on the piece of paper. And then you can see whether if the LED lights up or not. And you could compare that to, say, for example, graph, um, graphite from a from pencil, smudge, or others. Yeah, yeah. good suggestion. suggestion. I promise you, if you will be the spokesman again on the science uh, on stage and I will be there, then I will have done this experiment. I promise Good you. Man. Good man. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you very much, Michael, for asking that. And we have one question from the audience. And Sven is asking, Michael, are there any specific uses of the different boron isotopes? Yes, very good question. And indeed, I, I wanted to come to that at the beginning. I, I mentioned it very briefly, uh, but time was uh, running out. It's actually linked, uh, the importance of the different boron isotopes are linked to uh, the one of the previous uh, talks this evening, and that's with uranium. So uh, uranium, one of the many uses of uranium is, of course, in, in uh, nuclear uh, fission reactors. So because of the, the sheer size of, of uranium with its 
not, I don't know, is it 92 protons and I don't know how many neutrons. It's so massive, it's so unstable, or at least some of its isotopes are so unstable. It has a tendency to fall apart, as, as was demonstrated with alpha particles coming out and all that kind of thing. And if that fission reaction, that, that can lead to, you know, the generation of, of large amounts of energy, which is, the, you know, the basis of, of nuclear fission energy that we're using in our reactors to generate electricity. And that reaction is propagated uh, by uh, neutrons. So for every uranium nucleus that falls apart, that, that fissures, it releases three neutrons. And those three neutrons go to, to start further fission reactions. And so you get an exponential growth of the, of the, uh, the fission reaction. Now, if you want to control, we need to control nuclear reactions so it doesn't get out of hand like it did in Chernobyl. So, and to control nuclear reactions, uh, nuclear fission, what we do is we need something that can absorb these neutrons. So if you imagine if, if, the, if the nuclear fission of uranium is, is propagated by these, these neutrons, if we can absorb some of them, we can control the, the rate at which the uranium will, will fissure. And the perfect thing for that is boron-10. Not boron-11, but boron-10. Because boron-10, of course, is quite happy to take a neutron to become boron-11. So that's one, one really important use. So it's really important in the nuclear uh, industry. A second thing is that a similar process, boron neutral capture process, can be useful in, uh, in, medicinal, in a medicinal context. It can be used for the treatment of certain uh, tumors, cancerous growths, which are on the, on the periphery, on the, on our, on our, which can be easily uh, got to. And the sense that you can, you can irradiate, you can irradiate boron at 10 isotopic containing materials, and they will take on that neutron, and they will uh, begin then a, a new process of a sort of almost like a transmutation into lithium, and that will, that can destroy the cell in which it's located. So the, what isotope of boron is being used is really important. It's also actually really important in the lab when we're, when we're using different spectroscopic techniques and, spectro and, and also mass spectrometry to actually distinguish between uh, different, uh, you know, different compounds we might have. And that gets quite complicated. But the fact that we have these two different isotopes gives us almost like uh, handles on which we can explore the structure of boron compounds even, even better. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. And I would like to ask Nasco now. And uh, science on stage was mentioned a few times already. And I would like to ask you simply, what was your experience with science on stage this year in Prague? Well, it, it was a really, really nice experience though. Uh, it was my uh, third time going to science on stage. And uh, this time I saw quite a lot uh, more projects because I, I got the time for that. And um, quite a lot of uh, new stuff that I haven't really tried before. So, yeah. Uh, and of course, it was my first time in Prague, which was wonderful. Uh, Prague is really, really a nice city. But um, the point is that... Uh, Quite a lot more people were uh, were quite well. It felt like more people were eager to speak now, um, because um, of course we had uh, a, a little bit of pandemic going on. So so most of the teachers there were looking like they really wanted to go out of their country and come there and talk to other people. So. It was one of the best sounds on stages I've been to. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. And I think I've seen a glimpse of Michael's question to Adam, I guess. Really? Is, is that correct? Oh, uh, maybe it's just something else. What, was, it, was it you, Michael, asking? Yeah, yeah, to, yes, to, um, is it Adam? I, I'm sorry, I'm not very good at remembering. Yeah, the, Adam, the, yes. The standing next to you is Adam. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, my, my, you, Adam, you had uh, your guy, you were showing us your Geiger counter, which can count all these um, subatomic particles being ejected from radioactive yeah, right. uh, elements. 
And I was wondering what is, my question is, what is the most radioactive fruit or vegetable that we eat? Uh, it is a Brazilian nut, I think, or banana. Yeah. Yeah, but I think well, Brazilian nut have more, more uh, potassium forty than banana. So I think Brazilian nut. Yeah, or mushrooms, so. because mushrooms uh, uh, con uh, have a lot of heavy, heavy metals inside. Or could be, could be there. Uh, so some yeah. kind of mushrooms from certain areas it's also could be radioactive. So. So Don't do you do you when you go to eat when you go to eat at a restaurant do you, and you want to have mushrooms or fish or whatever do you take take out your Geiger counter and check out? Yeah, not really, not really. <laughs> Didn't try that yet. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, it's thank a nice breaker in a in a date, isn't it? We pick <laughs> out the Geiger counter on, on a date. Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, I think that's all the questions from the audience. And I know that, Mark, you have one experiment that you did not have time to perform during your performance. Do you think you could show it to us now? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, no problem. If uh, Alice can uh, open my PowerPoint presentation, then I can demonstrate it. Uh, a little bit further in the presentation. Further, further, further. Yes, yeah, stop. So it's uh, it's about um, the chemistry about uh, samurai swords. Um, you can go to the next slide, please, um, Alice. So if you start a new uh, the first uh, movie, yes. So the the first thing is we bend a hairpin, and uh, the students have to remember how much force they use uh, for bending this hairpin. Then they have a second hairpin. They have to um, make it red hot and then they will cool it down uh, very quickly in uh, cold water. The water is 18 degrees. Uh, probably the temperature in a the metal, they will be 1400 degree degrees more or less. So they cool it down very quickly. Then Go on, please. Oh, <laughs> uh, you have to continue with the movie, uh, Alice. Uh, this is too quick. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is the um, moment with the second um, hairpin. It's red hot. And now we will cool it very slowly in a yellow flame by lifting it up. And uh, we use more or less 20 to 25 seconds to lift it up and cool it down very slowly. So now we have two hairpins, uh, one cooled very, very quick and one uh, very slowly. And then we have to examine the difference between the, the hairpins. So the first one, they have to bend again and uh, compare the power. But this one breaks. The second one bends more easily than the than, than the original uh, one and this whole process is um, uh, used in a samurai sword because uh, first what happens with the first uh, material uh, the, f the first metal is uh, heated and then cooled down very quickly and the metal that is formed there is martensite and martensite is a very uh, hard material very tough so if you want to make a sharp samurai sword or knife, you use a hard material, in this case, uh, a martensite. But if you hit with your sword a very hard object, then your sword will break. And uh, you don't want a broken sword, uh, especially when it's uh, 30,000 euros. So you don't want it. Um, so uh, then you have to use a metal that is more bendable if you want to keep the sword uh, alive. So, but if you use a sword that's bendable, you can make it sharp, but it will not stay very sharp. So during the process of making a samurai sword, the, the, the makers of the sword uh, use both techniques to make the two metals that we saw here. So they put on a, a thin layer of clay on the side that has to be sharp and a thick uh, clay of lay, a layer of clay uh, on the side that have to be bendable. Then they heat the material 
till red hot. And after this material is red hot, they cool it down in water. And on the edge where it was a little thin layer of clay, the cooling down is going to be very quickly. So there will be martensite, hard material. And on the other side, uh, with a thick layer of, uh, clay of, lay of <laughs> clay, sorry, um, the cooling down is uh, slowly. And there another material is made, and that material is bendable. So this process can be demonstrated with a very simple hair clip process with a beautiful story about how they make a samurai sword. Thank you, Alice. <laughs> yes, we had to finish it once they had it. Yeah, yeah okay, uh, I know, I know. Thank, I know. You, thank you all for this additional uh, additional demonstration. And as, as we saw again in a very like a simple object, as, as you see it in a finished product, there's a lot of chemistry going on during yeah. the process. Great that we can we can have some experiments that uh, get us closer to the chemistry of it. And also, uh, what I liked about this demonstration is that even a hairpin, and yeah, of course, a torch, uh, can be a science prop, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, my question then would be, uh, um, I think Adam already mentioned that he has his science prop, that uh, the Geiger counter, yeah. always on him. So maybe I would ask all of you then, do you have any kind of science props that you always carry with you, Nasco? Well, the, the, in my pockets, you can always find some salts and pieces of metal and strange rocks. So, yeah, I, I, I don't have a favorite science prop, but in my backpack, you, you can use to make a science show or experiment, experiment in, in any case. It's just there. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Michael? Well, um, something I always have in my pocket. I'm not sure. Mo a lot of the things I have are usually pretty big. They're too big for my pocket. But I generally have in my pocket a, a little bit of a, a stash of uh, gun cotton. That's pretty good and effective. You know, if you if you soak 100% um, cotton buds or gauze or something like that in, in a mixture of concentrated nitric and sulfuric acid, and then you neutralize with... I don't know, sodium carbonate or something, um, and let it dry, then you form what's called gun cotton, which is a uh, nitrocellulose. Um, and uh, that's extremely flammable and it burns without any uh, smoke or anything. It's very effective. It's, it's good to, you know, to show kids. You can just put some in your hand and light it up and it goes. Whoosh. So yeah. that's pretty good to have, I think. Uh huh. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, Mark, do you have any uh, favorite props that you carry? Um, most of the time I have um, um, uh, flash paper with me um, in a, a 10 euro note. So it's more or less the same as what Michael explained about uh, gun cotton. It's the same material, uh, but this is uh, paper. Um, so I have a 10 uh, euro note and then I can light it and then throw it away and then not no smoke no nothing the flame goes high and then it disappears um, uh -huh. that's what I usually have uh, with me yeah I think I saw saw you uh, in similar demonstration but you took a note from an audience is that correct but you don't light that one up right no, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, I, I did. But what I did with that note was uh, we we did the note in a um, alcohol water mixture, and the mixture is sixty percent alcohol, forty percent water, and we put a little bit uh, sodium chloride to it. And when you then uh, dip it into the mixture and burn it, only the alcohol will burn, and the water cools down the paper, and the sodium chloride gives a very nice orange flame to it mm -hmm. so yes we, we did uh, burn also paper money from the audience but they got it back <laughs> that's perfect uh, perfect scenario okay and i would like now to ask adam and uh, it was already mentioned i think it was mark who mentioned that uh in netherlands and i think it's the case in czech republic as well that the science subjects are taught separately yeah so physics, chemistry, and chemistry, physics yeah. Right? biology also yeah 
but also I, when we saw the experiments, we saw there's a lot of all of this stuff going on at the same time, and you are not chemist. Um, yeah, I'm not a chemist. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, but uh, we saw that you can be in a chemist show because uh, even in physics of radioactivity, there's a lot of chemistry. And when you work with kids, right. is it hard for you to actually talk in a more complex manner because they are used to separating these uh, these subjects, or do you find it easy? to just say, like, this is the transition between chemistry, physics. Yeah, I try to combine everything. Yeah. Not, not only the science subjects, like the chemistry and science and bio biology, but also a little bit of history or mm -hmm. politics. In uranium, there is a lot of politics. <laughs> yeah. So you can also talk about that. And about history and uranium, you can talk about uh, political prisoners in mines in our last regime in Czech Republic. So mm -hmm. it's also... Uh, interesting thing to combine everything and put it more into wide perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's great that children have places like these, like that they can learn uh, in the whole complexity of things, not only yeah. in the narrow subject. And as you mentioned politics, I don't want to end politically, yeah. here, <laughs> but yeah. I have one question get gets to a little bit political. And that is uh, that I find it a great challenge now in the era of social media and short detention span to have an effective science communication. And I would like to ask all of you, what do you think is the best way uh, how, to, how to maneuver in this era of short detention span and be an effective science communicator? And I would like to start with that. Well, uh, of course, uh, one thing is to branch out. You can, uh, if you have uh, a type of presentation uh, that you're familiar with and you go through it and go through it and go through it, and not, not many people go about it and go and see you, then you need to branch out, try new stuff, go where people are. Um, go outside, go into um, a, a, some social media that you know your students are interested in. So just just go about spread spread your wings and and try to to find where the people are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Mark. Can I hear your thoughts on this? Um, I think it's a very difficult question because uh, honestly, um, I'm not happy with social media. Not at all, um, but it, it's in our community, so we have to deal with it, but um, I'm not happy with it. But if we have to deal with it, um, the communication that we have should be short, uh, enthusiastic, to the point, and then you will have the most ef effect, I think, on using social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Adam, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I tried a lot of uh, uh, like broadcasting during the COVID era, mm -hmm. the restriction. So I tried to use social media uh, as a, as a, a speak to children yeah, and uh, students. But and I think that it's not our purpose to change their mind and. Uh, change their behavior of the children, but we should uh, show them the path in social media. The nice thing about social media, what can be used uh, for more connecting world and to spread the wisdom and knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, social media is all about algorithms. Right? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. It is. So we can That's... exploit the algorithms by giving good content and. Yeah, it's also true. Yeah, creative pitfalls, scientific pitfalls, educational pitfalls. And also, Michael, uh, can I get your thoughts? Yeah, I think a lot of what Adam says uh, makes a lot of sense. And I agree with him, both on the perspective of trying to combine lots of different disciplines into one, that sort of holistic approach. Certainly in terms of research work, definitely we're having to become more and more multidisciplinary. You know, the, you, you would find it very difficult to publish in good journals if it was just chemistry, I'm, I'm combining all the time with physics, biology, etc. So you need that approach, and I, I like the I like the the concept of also putting in their politics, putting in their art, putting in their 
drama, whatever it might be. Um, I think what makes very effective communication is it's to a large extent, it's all about enthusiasm and it has to be genuine. When you're talking about things, it has to be a people switch on if you are genuine, if your enthusiasm is genuine, then people want to listen. Um, when it comes to social media and audiences and, 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 and low attention spans, I think also what Adam says is also true. You can't, you can't sort of force feed somebody who doesn't want to listen something which you want to create. Just create something which, which you enjoy creating and the audience finds it or it, or it doesn't, you know, and there's going to be, there's going to be a, a group of group of kids, people, whoever, who will take the time, who will watch the content, who will be inspired by that and who will go places. We don't need everybody to become a, a scientist. It would be great if more people, generally speaking, became more interested in science. But, you know, if somebody hasn't got the, the, the attention span to, to, to last a couple of minutes, then, you know, it's their fault and not yours. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your thoughts on this. And also for the whole for the whole stream. I mean, uh, my last question would be to the studio if we have any unanswered questions from the audience. And if not, which is the case, I would like to again, thank you for the performances. It was such a pleasure to have brilliant science communicators on stream live interacting with the audience and we can see it works even in even when the COVID is over. And again, uh, we, you can follow us on social media. You can follow us uh, like everywhere you watch the stream and we prepare streams every few months. Even the Czech stream will start in the uh, 29th of November. And you can definitely look forward for another international stream in the spring next year. So again, thank you very much for the night. And I wish you like great rest of the night and uh, that you take a lot of inspiration from these performances. So good night and hopefully see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>